Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. Well, welcome to all of you here at Central Campus on this beautiful sunny day. Amen. Amen. And uh, also to those of you who are meeting together at our other campuses in Airdrie, Bridgeland, South Calgary, and in Crowfoot in the northwest part of Calgary, and those of you who are joining us online. I want to talk to you today about a place that people would rather not talk about. Some Calgarians are open to talking about this place, but most get pretty upset when you bring this place up. Nobody thinks that they're going to end up there, but people do. I want to talk to you today about Edmonton. I, I'm, I'm just kidding. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I love you Edmontonians. I really do. I, I, I know I pick on you from time to time, but only when I'm really desperate for just a little laughter. And uh, given the subject matter today, Lord knows we need it. So uh, anyways, uh, seriously, we're in a series in which we are examining what it is Christians believe and why it is we believe it. And today I want to talk to you about perhaps the greatest objection people have with the Christian faith, a subject that seems to evoke more emotion in people than almost any other issue that they have with Christianity, and that is what the Bible says about hell. As you saw in the video, people have all kinds of opinions about hell and the afterlife, but I want us to examine the scriptures, and in particular, what Jesus had to say about this subject. But before we get into it, would you please stand with me, and let's commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, your word says that we don't always understand why things are the way that they are. And our subject today, Lord, is one of those areas And so I pray, Lord, that you would reveal your truth to us in this time together. Despite the emotions that are often attached to this subject, I ask that you would give us all an open mind, a soft heart, and the courage to hear all that you would want to say to us. You know, Lord, this message has been weighing heavy on my heart all week. It brings me no joy to talk about it. And so I ask for an extra measure of your love and your grace and also courage that I won't get in the way of what you want to say and do in the hearts of people today. For I pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Lee Strobel, in his book, Case for Faith, he writes, when he was an atheist, he found his sense of justice outraged by the Christian teaching about hell. He writes, the doctrine seemed like cosmic overkill to me, an automatic and unappealable sentence to an eternity of torture and torment. What kind of God enjoys seeing his creatures writhe forever without hope, beyond redemption, in a torture chamber every bit as ghastly and barbaric as a Nazi concentration camp? If you have similar feelings to those of Strobel today, I want to challenge you to set aside your feelings long enough to examine what the scriptures have to say about this subject rather than rejecting the idea of hell simply because you don't like the idea of there being one. We hate tsunamis, we hate hurricanes, we hate earthquakes, but that doesn't mean that we ignore them or that we assume they don't exist. You see, it's important we understand that the God of the Bible, he hates hell. He hates people going there. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, the Lord is patient. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says, God our Savior wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. That is the heart of our God and must always serve as a foundation as we look at this particular subject. Hell was not part of God's original creation. Dr. J.P. Moreland, to whom I'm indebted for some of the insights I share with you, he says, in the same way that those who founded our country didn't start out by creating jails, so God didn't start out making hell. Hell was something that God was forced to make because, first of all, Lucifer, Lucifer and the other fallen angels and then people chose to rebel against God and turn from his best intentions for them. In the same way that a just society requires jails to deal with injustice, so a just God requires hell for those who live in rebellion. And so as we grow in our understanding of what Jesus said in the scriptures about hell, let's remember that God hates hell as much as we do. Now, Jesus taught that hell is a reality. Hebrews 9.27 says, Man is destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. That particular verse clearly teaches that there is no such thing as reincarnation. No, it says man is destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. Well, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, Jesus described the day of judgment this way. I encourage you to open your Bibles to Matthew 25. This is what we read there. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then if you go down to verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then down in verse 46, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now in this passage, Jesus says a day is coming when every person will stand before holy God and God will separate people one from another. Those on his right who are described as obedient followers of Jesus Christ are welcomed into heaven. Those on his left who are described as selfish, disobedient uh, people are sent to eternal punishment. We don't have time to review them, but Jesus taught the same thing more than once. He taught this in Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. He also taught it in Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. In all of these passages and many others, too many to mention, Jesus clearly taught that hell is a reality. In fact, Jesus said more about hell than he did about heaven. He said more about hell than he did about love. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Folks, there is no disputing the fact that Jesus believed that there was a heaven and a hell. The idea of the universalist that all people will eventually go to heaven is a comforting thought. In fact, let me just be very clear up front that no true Christian should ever delight in telling people about hell or the possibility that they are headed there. No, our hearts should be broken. Tears should come to our eyes every time we talk about the reality of hell. 
But having said that, it would be nice to believe, as some do, that hell is a type of three-star hotel with no room service and a lumpy bed. But once patrons see the luxury five-star high-rises along the beach of heaven, they will see what they're missing and they will move. It's an appealing thought that everyone will one day end up in heaven. I wish it were so. The problem is you have to reject not only the scriptures, but you have to reject what Jesus taught, and you have to, as a result, reject Jesus to come to such a conclusion. Jesus was very clear on these matters. And so with that in mind, let's look briefly at this issue of what hell is like. To begin with, hell is a real place. Now, I've already made a case for this, but I do want to point out that when we say hell is a real place, we are saying it's a real destination. It is a real part of the universe, but that it exists in another dimension in the same way that heaven exists in another dimension. And so we need to remember as we read the scriptures that when biblical writers talk about heaven or they talk about hell, they are trying to describe for us things in another dimension that we are totally unfamiliar with. And as a result, they often use metaphors or they use figurative language to describe what heaven's like and what hell is like. But hell itself is a real place. Secondly, hell is separation from God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, it describes hell as being shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. You see, the thing which makes heaven heaven is the fact that God will be there. His presence will be there. The thing which makes hell hell is the fact that God's presence will not be there. Everything that heaven will be, hell will not be. The Bible declares heaven to be a place of perfect love, perfect belonging, and a place of true peace and rest. Well, hell will be the exact opposite. It will be a place of loneliness, isolation, pride, selfishness, and greed. There will be no rest there and no relief from regret and resentment. Can you imagine the hopelessness of that, to be where God's presence is not? In Revelation 9, verse 1, hell is described as a bottomless pit. In other words, in hell you will feel like you are falling further and further away from all that is good and loving and right with no hope of return. Hell fundamentally is separation from God. We have no idea of how horrid this planet would be if God's presence were not here, if he were not holding back the forces of evil. We have no idea what our life would be like if God wasn't engaged on this planet and in this universe. Thirdly, hell is separation from others. Some people have this idea that hell is going to be a fun place filled with parties, orgies, and good times with good friends. Well, hell is not going to be like that at all. There's no community in hell. It's a place of aloneness. In Matthew 25, verse 11, Jesus likens heaven to that of a wedding banquet. A wedding is a picture, if you think about it, a picture of community, a picture that, uh, of, of um, people together in a, a joy-filled environment, lots of laughter. Those who are in hell are pictured as being shut out from the banquet hall, having no community, no joy or laughter. People who end up in hell are proud. They're arrogant. They're selfish. They're distrustful. They're concerned only about their own interests. And if you think about it, it is precisely those qualities here on this planet which create conflict, 
which divide people, which kill community. And of course, the trajectory of that will be extended to hell. And it'll just be more of the same. There will be isolation there. Hell is separation from others. But fourthly, hell is a place of anguish. And Matthew 8, 12 says, in hell there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping is what you do when you're feeling hopeless and sad. Well, what about gnashing of teeth? Some people believe that that means people are gnashing their teeth from pain. But let me ask you, when you hit your thumb with a hammer, what sound do you make? I mean, most normal people just kind of go, ow! Now, if you're a tough guy like me, you'll go, mm! but regardless, you don't gnash your teeth when you're in pain. So when do you gnash your teeth? Well, picture this. You have missed your son's hockey games numerous times, even though you promised each time that you would be there. And today, once again, you promise your son that you will attend his final hockey game of the year. Unfortunately, you fail to exercise rigor in ending your meeting at work on time. And as you rush out to the car, you look at your watch and you realize that even if you hit all of the green lights and if you drive double the posted speed limit, you will miss over half of your son's game. And so there you are, driving like an out-of-control emergency vehicle, weaving in and out of traffic, and wouldn't you know it, you get pulled over by a police. Your blood pressure is 200 over 110, and you know you will now miss your son's entire game yet again. As you wait for the police to write you up, you repeatedly hit your hands, if not your head, against the steering wheel. You grit your teeth, and you say, Ugh! I can't believe I got myself into this situation again. Why, why, why do I keep doing this? Mm. Or perhaps instead of blaming yourself, you do what so many people tend to do today, and that is you deflect the responsibility away from yourself and you blame the police. You pour out your anger on the police person for being the cause of you missing your son's game. But all that to say you don't gnash your teeth when you're in physical pain. You gnash your teeth when you are in emotional pain. When you are filled with regret for your own actions or when you're just angry at someone else. Well, in the same way, People who have ignored God or stubbornly resisted God all of their lives, when they get to hell, they will be full of anger. They will gnash their teeth at God. They will blame him. They will accuse him. They will curse at him for what has happened to them. Hell is a place of anguish. Fifthly, hell is eternal. In Matthew 18, verse 8, Jesus talks about eternal fire. Hebrews 6, verse 2, talks about hell being a place of eternal judgment. Now, there are those who believe that even though people will be sent to hell in punishment for consistently ignoring and rejecting God, they believe that they will be ultimately destroyed or annihilated sometime after they arrive in hell. They point to passages like Psalm 37, which says, the wicked will be no more. And yet there are numerous passages that clearly articulate that hell is eternal, including the parables that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 13, 22, and also 25, which we've already um, referred to. 
In Matthew 25, verse 46, Jesus said, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now, some people maintain that the words eternal punishment refers to annihilation. However, the same Greek word for eternal is used to describe both heaven and hell. And in fact, if you look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, it's exactly the same phraseology that's used. So, this word eternal is used to describe both heaven and hell, which means if we believe that this is saying that we are going to be annihilated in hell, then logically we must conclude that we are going to also be annihilated in heaven, which of course is not the case at all. Now, annihilationists also refer to passages like Jude chapter 7, where hell is described as an eternal and unquenchable fire. They say that if hell is a place of eternal fire, then it only makes sense that those who go there will be consumed or annihilated by the flames. And yet, Dr. Moreland says, we know the reference to flames is figurative because if you take it literally, it makes no sense in relation to the other passages. For example, the Bible describes hell as a place of utter darkness, complete darkness. The Bible also describes hell as a lake of fire, a place of unquenchable fire. So you have complete darkness and you have a lake of fire. Did you see the problem if you look at both of those literally? Flames would tend to light up the darkness, would they not? In Revelation 20, verse 14, we read this, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Now, we know that Hades isn't a person, it's a, a realm similar to that of heaven. And heaven can't be burnt. Hades can't be burnt because it's a realm. And of course, how do you burn death? So you see, it's pretty evident that the lake of fire is meant to stand for judgment and not a place of literal burning. And so even though hell is eternal, it is not a place of everlasting torture. Finally, hell is a place of utter heartbreak. Marilyn Manser, Manson, leader of the heavy metal band by the same name, indicated that he is confident that he's going to end up in hell when he dies. Laughing, he said, you know, I'm going to say that hell would probably be a more comfortable place for me because everyone I know would be there and I wouldn't really be allowed to do anything in heaven that would be any fun. And as I said earlier, there's many people who have a similar view of hell. They picture hell to be similar to one of those beer commercials that you see on television, you know, where everyone's kind of partying and they're in a state of complete ecstasy and saying over and over again, you know, it just doesn't get any better than this. And yet people like this have failed to realize that the reality of heaven and hell has absolutely nothing to do with their opinions. Only God is in a position to describe the reality of hell. And friends, even though hell may not be a torture chamber, the Bible makes it very clear that hell is the last place that you would want to end up at. You see, any figure of speech in the Bible has a literal point. What is figurative is the burning flame. What is literal is that this is a place of utter heartbreak. It is a place of no relief from self-centeredness, from self-loathing, from resentment, misery, boredom. It is a loss of everything, and it is the worst possible situation that could ever happen to a person. The Bible uses the word Gehenna to describe hell. Gehenna 
was a deep valley outside of Jerusalem, which at the time served as a huge smoldering dump. It was a place where worthless things were thrown. And so when the Bible uses the word Gehenna to describe hell, it's saying that people in hell will be consciously aware that now and for eternity, God has judged them as having no value. His eye is no longer on them. His purpose for them is gone. It is wiped out. His love and protection are removed. Can you imagine the painful helplessness and hopelessness of that? Friends, don't ever buy into the deception that hell's just going to be a great place to go to. It's an awful destination. Which leaves us with the question that we start out with. How can a loving God send anyone to such a place? Two reasons. Because of his justice and because his love requires it. First of all, because his justice requires it. God is just, and when he sees evil and he sees injustice in the world, he can't turn a blind eye to it. It would be contrary to his very nature, his love and his justice to do so. The Bible says that we are made in God's image, which means we are wired up with God's sense of justice. And to give you a sense of that, let me ask you this. If your husband or your best friend was murdered by terrorists, how would you feel toward them? Wouldn't there be something inside of you that says there has been an injustice that's been done and that these wrongdoers need to pay for their crimes? Or let me ask you this. How would you feel if our justice system said to the person who sexually abused your child, well, you know, you grew up in a, a very dysfunctional home and you lived under some pretty bad living conditions. And frankly, your record isn't all that bad. <coughs> and so tell you what, instead of sentencing you to prison, if you promise to behave yourself, I'm going to let you go. Just don't do it again, okay? So if that was said to the person who sexually abused your child. How would you feel about that? Isn't there something inside of you that would be enraged by that? Well, you see, that sense of justice inside of you comes from God. You and I are made in the image of God. Now, we know that God is loving and he's merciful, but we also know that he is just and holy. He's morally perfect, which means he cannot turn his back on sin or injustice. God's very nature will not allow him to say, well, Hitler, you know, you, you, you murdered all kinds of people at Auschwitz, but I understand that you're simply a product of your environment, and I'm an all-forgiving God, so come on in. Come into heaven. I mean, how would we all feel if God was like that? We would conclude that's not a loving God at all. Yale theologian Miroslav Wolf, who has seen violence in the Balkans, he says, if God were not angry at injustice and deception, that God would not be worthy of worship. Becky Pippert says, God's wrath is not a cranky explosion, but his settled opposition to the cancer which is eating out the insides of the human race that he loves with his whole being. In other words, she's saying that God's anger directed at injustice and sin actually flows out of his love and his delight in his creation. He is angry 
at evil. He is angry at injustice and anything else that is bent on destroying his creation. No different than you as a parent would be angry at anything or anyone who's bent on hurting or destroying your loved ones. And God promises us this, even though sometimes we may not see justice played out in this life, he promises to make all injustices right one day. In his time and in his way, we can trust him in this because he's a just God. Now, I'm sure that we understand that and why hell is necessary. We can appreciate why the murderers, the terrorists, the, the, the rapists, the child molesters, they deserve hell. The problem is most of us think because we haven't done any of these horrible crimes, we don't deserve to go to hell. <coughs> Yet why do we think that God should ignore lying, cheating, sexual sins, greed, and a host of other wrongs that most of us commit? from time to time. You see, from our perspective, murder seems to be so much of a greater crime than greed. And yet, as I've pointed out a number of times, how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have died of malnutrition and hunger this year alone because of the greed in our world? Most people agree that the terrorists who masterminded 9-11 are deserving of hell. And yet, what about all the people along the way who likely for a little bit of money under the table looked the other way or lied or did some other in, little indiscretion to aid the terrorists? Oh, they probably had no idea of what was going on or how their little sin would impact the grand scheme of things. To them, it was just a little lie. To them, it was just a little deliberate oversight. And yet, in the end, it all came together and it played a pivotal role in the tragedy of 9-11. How many people have died either physically or emotionally because someone didn't keep his word? or because someone cheated on her vows. You see, sin is sin. And every sin, regardless of how insignificant we may think it is, can have huge implications. And God sees it, and he knows about it. And he doesn't overlook it. The Bible says we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all said no to God. We've all rebelled against him. We're guilty before him. And unless our sinful condition is paid for, the wrath of God remains on us. And our destiny is to be forever separated from God in hell. Now again, God loves us. And he doesn't want us to be separate. He doesn't want us to be separated from him. And yet his justice demands that our sins be paid for. And so God does an amazing thing even though his justice demands that he sentence us to hell. Out of love for us, he seeks to rescue us. He sends his one and only son, Jesus, to die on a cross in our place to pay for our sins. All our sins are placed on him. That's what grace is. Grace is unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. And yet it's the only way that God could satisfy his justice and yet provide a way for us to have a second chance to be set free. And so if we by faith accept God's offer of forgiveness and grace through Jesus Christ, if we surrender our life to him, if we faithfully follow him, the trajectory of our eternity will change. 
from walking toward hell, we turn around and we start walking toward Jesus and ultimately heaven. On the other hand, if we continue to ignore or reject or rebel against God, then God's perfect justice has no choice but to leave us in our sin and our lost condition and to leave us keep walking away from Him and walking toward eternal separation from Him in hell. God sends people to hell not only because His justice requires it, but secondly, He sends people to hell because His love requires it. Brian Wilkerson says, suppose you are an earthly parent and your child decides he wants nothing to do with you. He leaves home and heads for the West Coast. What are your options as a parent? Well, you can send him letters expressing your love. You can send money to help him get on his feet. You can attempt to go and to visit him if he'll let you and plead with him to come home and to renew your relationship. But if you love him, there is one thing you cannot do. You cannot bind him hand and foot, drag him home, and chain him to his bed for the rest of his life. That is not love. That's kidnapping and imprisonment. And God doesn't work that way. You see, God is love, and He wants us to return His love freely. He wants us to come to Him freely from the heart. And so He gives us the freedom to love Him back or to ignore Him and reject Him. If we ignore or reject Him, think about it. What is He to do? In Romans 1, we have a description of man going his own way rather than God's way. We read there that even though deep down inside they knew God, they suppressed the truth because they didn't want God messing with the way that they were living their lives. Instead of worshiping God who made them, they chose to worship instead the things that God had made. They fell in love with the good life. They fell in love with power, with possessions, and with position. And every kind of sinful pleasure, it says, which in time grew into all kinds of depraved thinking and disgusting perversions. As people tried to fill that void inside of them, which only God can fill. And in verse 24, it tells us what God did in response to all that. In verse 24, it says, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. Down in verse 26, it says, and God gave them over to shameful lusts. Down in verse 28, it says, and God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they did what ought not to be done. Did you notice the phrase that keeps being repeated there? God gave them over. John Ortberg says it's one of the saddest words in the New Testament. It means to hand over control and responsibility. You see, friend, you can say to God either directly or indirectly through the decisions that you make in this life, you can say to him, I don't want you in my life. I don't want to follow you. Just leave me alone. You can say to others who talk to you about God, just leave me alone. Mind your own business. 
And in time, God will say, okay. And he will leave you alone. And this the Bible calls hell. God gave them over. He let them go the direction they wanted to go. Dr. Peter Kreeft, he puts it this way. Those who do not wish to love God must be allowed not to love him. Those who do not want to be with God must be allowed to be separated from him. The answer then to this question that we started out with, why would a loving God send people to hell? In the strictest sense is this, because that is the destination that they have chosen all along. Now please understand, I don't believe most people consciously choose hell. But they choose to ignore God. They choose to reject God. They choose to reject God's offer of love, of life, of forgiveness. And they choose to do it again and again and again. In short, hell is the logical consequence of a life that's lived separated from God. It is the trajectory of a soul that has been living a godless, self-absorbed, self-centered life, a place where those who don't want God's interference, who don't want God's guidance in their life, it is a place where God is silent and leaves them alone. Dr. D.A. Carson put it this way. Hell is not a place where people are consigned because they were pretty good folks, but they just didn't believe all the right stuff. They're consigned there, first and foremost, he says, because they defy their maker and want to be at the center of the universe. See, it's not that God hasn't provided every possible means for people to ultimately be with him in heaven. It's just that some get their back up. They're set on being at the center of their own universe, living life their own way. And essentially they say, forget it. I'm not interested. I'm not putting my life, my future in the hands of anyone. And they take a big step around the cross of Jesus and continue to walk the broad road away from Jesus, a road that leads to eternity without Jesus. Now, some of you are wondering, I'm sure, about the fate of those who have never heard about Jesus. I plan to deal with that question another time. For now, just be assured that God will judge each person uniquely and fairly but the issue today is this. You're standing at the cross of Jesus. What will you do with Jesus? Some of you here have bumped into the cross practically every weekend service. Some of you have bumped into the cross through the life of a Christian at work, at school, in your neighborhood. Others of you have bumped into the cross of Jesus through the wonder of God's creation or through the wonder of the birth of a child. See it for what it is. God is reaching out to you. He's trying to get your attention. Are you listening? Are you open to him? In closing, I want to emphasize that my intent in this message is not to scare anyone with hell. My intent is not to bribe anyone with heaven or to pressure anyone into making a decision that doesn't come from your heart.
Because at the end of the day, that's the only decision that Jesus is interested in, a decision that comes from your heart. But the fact is, you're staring at the cross of Christ right now. And you have a decision to make. What are you going to do with Jesus and his offer of eternal life through faith in him? It's decision time, friends. What do you sense when God is saying to you? Would you just close your eyes, please, and bow your heads just for a moment? I want to address three kinds of people today. Extend an invitation to three kinds of people. First of all, some of you know that you're not ready to meet God. If you're not sure where you would be moments after you die, you can know where you will spend eternity. If you feel something inside of you tugging at your heart, that is God saying to you, come home, son. Come home, daughter. Turn around and come to me. I died to make it possible to set you free. Come home. I invite you to come just as you are and embrace his love and grace by faith. Yes, it's going to take humility and courage, but trust me, when you close your eyes for the final time in this life and then you open them in eternity, you will never regret putting your trust in Jesus. Others of you would have to admit that even though you prayed a prayer to receive Christ somewhere in your past, they were just words. You really didn't surrender to Jesus at all. Maybe you just wanted a ticket to heaven. You wanted to escape hell. But you have to admit that your life just is still totally revolving around you. Nothing has really changed. I'm going to invite you to come just as you are and turn your life over completely to Him. And finally, if, if you're a believer here, a Christ follower, perhaps you've been reminded today in a new way of the reality of hell your heart is heavy for someone or for a number of people who are far from God you feel a renewed sense of urgency to pray for them, to reach out to them in love I'm going to invite you to come as well just as you are to this altar and to lift them up in prayer whatever you sense God is saying to you whether it is you need to reach out to him in faith whether it is you need to surrender completely to him or whether it is to come and to lift up someone that you care about in prayer. I'm going to invite you to make your way up here right now. The person next to you, they'll allow you to slip by. Just make your way up here. We're just going to wait a few moments for you to come and then we'll close in prayer.
going to ask the prayer partners if you would come up and also pastors who are present in the service, just be available to anyone who may want you to pray with them at the end of this service. of you have come forward I just want to say that if you if your desire if your heart's desire is that you want to become a Christ follower you need to first admit that you're a sinner that you've broken God's laws that you've been at the center of your life and that you want to turn around on the path that you're on you want to turn around and you want to begin to walk toward Jesus and the life that he offers you. You must believe in Jesus, that he he is as real as I'm standing here, that he died on the cross for our sins, and that he rose from the grave to give us the power to live a life, a full life here on earth, and eternal life in heaven. If that's your desire, I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me right now. You can pray it out loud if you'd like, Or if you wish, you can pray within your own spirit because God knows your thoughts. Just let it come from your heart. Let it come freely from your heart. Just join me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to go to heaven. I know heaven's a perfect place and I'm not. And so please forgive me of my sins and make me clean through the shed blood of Jesus so that I might be your child. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place, making it possible not only for me to be forgiven, but also to live in freedom and victory through you. As you gave your life for me, I now give my life to you in faith and accept you as my Savior and my Lord and commit to following you with all of my heart. For I pray it in the precious name of Jesus. friend, if you prayed that prayer, if it came from your heart, you can know on the authority of God's word that you are a child of God's. You're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You are, you've turned around. You are now walking toward Jesus, not away from him. And the scriptures tell us that surely goodness and mercy and love will follow you all the days of your life and one day you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever would the rest of you please stand Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God be with you. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter.